um, hopefully everybody did get a chance to have a super quick break um, before our next presentation uh, with that Keith uh, Reiming, who, uh, who I have the distinct uh, pleasure to uh, introduce to you all. Um, so uh, he's a lifelong videographer uh, working to uh, merge the art of documentary film with the necessity and urgency of classroom resources containing first person oral histories. We have a Bachelor of, uh, in Film Arts uh, in Film and TV Production uh, from New York University and, uh, and uh, a Master's in Education from uh, the University of Pittsburgh. His work centers around translating university uh, level uh, scholarship into K through 12 educational modules. Focusing on equity, inclusion, and diversity, Keith uses mixed methods technology to uh, present curriculum units in ways that are accessible to students from all lived experiences. And without further ado, I would like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Keith Friendly. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. I see some familiar names and faces. Um, I had every intention of hanging out with y'all earlier in the week um, and kind of being a part of the group, but uh, my wife and I have a two-year-old who got sick, and then we all got sick, and then it, you know, goes, goes on from there. Uh, but pleasure to talk to you. Um, so I am not an educator. Uh, I have a master's in social comparative analysis of education from Pitt. I don't have a lot of classroom, uh, classroom experience. My parents were both elementary school teachers. So a lot of experience before um, kind of leaving the nest, um, but I have not done it in a, in a professional sense. So I'm coming to you as, a, as an artist and a filmmaker and somebody who's interested in curriculum design uh, and equity, diversity and inclusion within curriculum units and making sure that um, students who are learning are learning based on their own lived experiences. Um, it is something that I feel very strongly about. Uh, but I'm here to talk today about a project that I worked on uh, a while ago called The Day of the Western Sunrise, which is a Kanishibai-inspired documentary film. Uh, and you will know exactly what all of that means here in a few minutes. Uh, I'm not sure what people know about Kanishibai or what Kanishibai is or any of that. Um, so I'm going to talk as if um, nobody knows anything, and then we can kind of suss all that stuff out later. Um, but the film is called Day of the Western Sunrise. And uh, as part of the, the, the group, uh, the retreat, the, the week, I believe you're getting uh, the film and the resource, uh, the resource packet that, that we developed for this. Uh, but it is a Japanese language, Kamishibai inspired documentary film. Um, this film was a four year, four to five year project. We started in 2014 and we had a world premiere in Pittsburgh in 2018, and I'm still talking about it in 2022. So it's been an amazing, wild experience uh, that I'm so super proud of and very glad to be continuing to engage with. Um, we had generous support, grant support from the Heinz Endowments, the Pittsburgh Foundation, and uh, NCTA here at Pitt, <clears throat> and also in kind of promotional support from the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh, uh, the Japanese American Society of Pennsylvania, and the University of Pittsburgh. And I always feel like it's important to introduce the people that put so much of their time and effort into this because it was a four year endeavor um, that a lot of people contributed to, but mostly these seven folks that, I'll, that I'm just gonna introduce you to. Um, Akigo Ogawa, Ms. Takago Kazuya and Kanako Mahatre. Um, Akiko was a on-site translation and interpretation. Uh, she basically interviewed the participants, uh, we, or I'm sorry, interviewed the, the interviewees. Um, we don't speak Japanese, I don't speak Japanese, none of the American crew spoke Japanese. So we had um, Akiko and Ms. Kazuya-san with us the entire time kind of speaking with uh, the fishermen um, and translating to us. Uh, and then Kana uh, was involved and still is involved in a way. Uh, she did all the translations for the movie including subtitles, including interviews, um, and including a lot of historical research to make sure that the, the time period, that we were accurate in depicting the time period. Um, and then uh, the four of us here, the American side, myself, 
directing, producing, editing, and kind of project managing. Uh, Josh Lapata and Justin Nixon are responsible for all of the animation. And I know that you probably haven't seen the film, but I'm, in, I'm, I'm saying this stuff now because when you do see it, when you do engage with it, I think it's important to understand the, the scope of the work, right? So 98, 97, 98% of this film is animation. And it was done by these two guys, Josh and Justin. Um, hand drawing in, on, on Wacom tablets, working on computers, these two guys, almost 600 animated shots, just an incredible amount of work. And I um, still to this day, just I, I can't say enough about the work ethic of these two dudes. Uh, and then my younger brother, Troy, uh, who I have had the pleasure of working with quite a bit in the past, uh, has written all the music, all the original arranging, composing and performing of the music in the film. So when you're watching it, when you're engaging with it, when your students are working with it, if that's your choice, uh, that is, is uh, the, the scope of work is something that's really important to get across. Uh, so Kamishi Bai inspired documentary. What, is, what does all this mean? Um, well, Kamishi Bai is a Japanese term for paper drama. Kami means paper, Shibai means drama. And it is a uh, paper storytelling uh, technique that was popular during the depression and post-war Japan until the advent of television. And I've kind of uh, put together three rather famous uh, Kamishibai stories here. I don't, uh, I have not read these, these stories per se. I don't, um, I don't know exactly what they are or what they mean, but um, when, when you engage with Kamishibai or when you start researching Kamishibai, these, these stories come up a lot um, and some pictures there to kind of show what Kamishibai is, right? Um, Kamishibai is a, a traveling art form. So in this era in Japan, uh, people known as Kamishibai men would ride their bicycles. There's a good de depiction of that down here. Uh, ride their bicycles from village to village with a wooden box on the back and with basically cartoons in the back of this box that they would, they would tell the story uh, based on the, the picture that was in front of them. And they would move the picture from um, the front to the back and they would kind of tell the story this way. It's like kind of like a, of like an early iteration of a cartoon, right? Um, and there's stories of how uh, Kamishibai had its origin in Buddhist temples where monks would read uh, imake mono or picture scrolls um, to kind of tell the temple's heritage. So um, there's a long, rich history of Kamishibai in Japan uh, and the art form continues. Um, it was very popular, as I said, in uh, post-World War II. And as a lot of things are resurging or when a lot of things resurge, they, 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 they're they having a resurgence today, right? There's a lot of uh, modern day artists that are hearkening back to this kind of technique. Uh, not just in Japan, uh, here in the US and all over the world. I believe this, this artist down here, I believe, I don't know his name, but I believe he's from Norway. Um, so no, there's no quiz or anything, but, um, and this is, these are pretty obvious questions, but one of these photos is real. One of them is a Kamishibai. Um, if anybody feels like, like opening up their microphone, um, what does the real photo make you think of? What does the Kamishibai photo make you think of? And does the Kamishibai photo elicit feelings the real photo doesn't? Do you get, do you feel different things by looking at these two pictures? Since I'm an art teacher, I'll go for this one. Um, so yeah, the the real photo I'm assuming is the one on the left, and it, it to me looks like a mushroom cloud of some sort, or some kind of explosion. And then on the right, um, the yellowness of the image is more like a sun or something. So it kind of seems like a little bit more dooming on the left and more hopeful on the right. Thank you. I like that. Um... I've got one more. What are the differences between these two images? One of them is an actual photograph. One of them is from a kamishibai, um, obviously depicting the same scene. Um, do you see any major differences? And if so, do the differences make the scene more or less powerful? Oh, 
Um, I think even just the one single teardrop on the Kanishi by makes it a much, it elicits more feelings for me. I don't know why, but, um, and maybe just the color palette as well. I think color is a really strong indicator of how you should feel towards something. And obviously the real photo is black and white, but with the Kanishi by, they had the option to add more color and the absence of it, I think, um, elicits a lot of emotions towards how you should feel towards it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And that that was kind of the one distinction. Um, the teardrop was kind of the one distinction I was going to bring up to the color thing. I didn't even really think about. Thank you. Um, but the teardrop is obviously added. Um, and it's a very non Japanese thing, right, to show a lot of emotion and to show a lot of like, you know, to to emote your feelings and to show vulnerability. It's It's not a very Japanese thing. So this artist who was a Japanese artist decided to to add that um, and we can kind of speculate on what on what what that means but I thought it was kind of an interesting addition um, and these these images will all come up again through the and and, and you'll get more context throughout the presentation um, yeah and so these are two these are two images here um, sorry I'm having trouble with my there we go uh, Castle Bravo and the death of Akichi Kubayama as depicted in the day of the Western Sunrise. So we've, um, our animators took those incidents that we just looked at, uh, which were actual incidents, uh, the detonation of Castle Bravo in 1954 and the subsequent death of Akichi Kubayama, who was a fisherman aboard the Lucky Dragon. And we kind of turned those into um, our own um, artistic expressions of, of that, of, of those incidents. So uh, I've introduced a couple of things that you might not have some context for. So that's, uh, I'm gonna take some time and kind of do that right now. A brief his uh, history of the film, the historical events that we're depicting and why they're so important. This is a global education week. So there's a lot of global, um, global thought and global systems thinking that can kind of be applied to these, these incidents here. And so it's really, um, it's worth going in depth into what we're talking about and how we got to where we are. Um, way back in 1938, a uh, handful of German scientists are credited with discovering nuclear fission, uh, thus making an atomic weapon a theoretical possibility. Um, nuclear fission is a nuclear reaction in which the, you split the nucleus, right? You break it apart, that's fission. Um, at the time it was very powerful, very powerful reaction, one of the most powerful reactions on the, on the face of the planet. Um, and this was discovered by German scientists in 1938. Uh, Albert Einstein uh, gets a hold of, or gets wind of these discoveries that have happened in Germany. And is actually, I believe he's actually a part of some of the research that uh, was going into it at this time, but he saw a lot of the potential in nuclear energy. Uh, and he writes a very uh, infamous letter to President Roosevelt saying, hey, um, FDR, we need to invest some federal money into this, um, what at the time is research that's only being done in universities and in educational settings. Uh, this is going to be a very lucrative, very powerful technology. We don't want the Germans to get it. We want to be the first ones to have this technology uh, on a broad, wide scale. And Truman agrees, I'm sorry, Truman Roosevelt agrees. Uh, and the federal funding leads to the Manhattan Project, uh, which is very famous Manhattan Project, a very famous nuclear step in the nuclear world, uh, 1942 to 1946. Um, Robert Oppenheimer is a very famous name um, in the nuclear world. Uh, he's known as the father of the atomic bomb. Uh, and the Manhattan Project effectively ends in uh, the, the latter part of 1945 when the U.S. tests Trinity, uh, which is the very first atomic explosion on the face of the planet that happens in White Sands, New Mexico on July 16th, 1945. July 16th, 1945 is important because not less than three weeks later, the U.S. drops uh, atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, effectively ending World War II. 
Um, but the U.S. did not stop there. And a lot of history textbooks, a lot of teaching will, that's kind of where we stop, right? Um, but nuclear, nuclear weapons testing uh, continued. Uh, the U.S. tested 29 nuclear devices between 1945 and 1952. All of the tests happened between the Nevada test site where Trinity went off. Or I'm sorry, um, uh, the Nevada test site, I believe it's known as Area 51. Um, or at the Pacific Proving Grounds, which is near, which is in the Marshall Islands. Um, all of these weapons, all of these 29 nuclear devices used that fission technology, the breaking apart of the atom. November 1st, 1952 is a red letter day in the history of nuclear technology because the US tests a weapon called Ivy Mike. And this is the first ever thermonuclear weapon test. Now thermonuclear, uh, technology uses nuclear fusion. And the difference between fusion and fission is kind of what it sounds, right? Fission is breaking apart, fusion is bringing together. So you can, uh, you, you, you fuse together atoms and molecules that would not be as powerful otherwise. And this was, um, Ivy Mike is very important because it's, a, it's not a weapon per se, but it's a proof of concept test. So the U.S. was like, we have this new technology. We don't know if it works. Let's try it out. It certainly did. Um, and so now there's this new, even more devastating technology that the U.S. has um, after uh, World War II and kind of in this, this post-war theater. Um, yeah, fusion rather than fission, different than Hiroshima and Nagasaki, different kind of fallout, different kind of containment, different kind of radiation poisoning, et cetera. Um, Castle Bravo uh, is important and kind of the, the, the event that we're centering here for the rest of our conversation. March 1st, 1954, 6.45 a.m. Castle Bravo is detonated near the Marshall Island, uh, near, near the Bikini Atoll in Marshall Islands. Uh, first in a series of six tests known as Operation Castle, it is 1,000 times more powerful than Hiroshima. It's three times more powerful than the U.S. thought it was gonna be. And it took place in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Proving Grounds. So why are we focusing on this? Why is this important? This detonation is important because 85 miles away rests a small tuna fishing boat called the Lucky Dragon Number no. 5 or Daigo Fukuyamaru in Japanese. Um, Daigo Fukuyamaru is a very small wooden fishing boat built with wood uh, after World War II because iron and steel and metal were very scarce. Um, there were 23 crewmen on board for this voyage. They were fishing 85 miles away from the epicenter of the blast. The crew recount seeing a bright flash of light on the horizon. They thought the sun rose in the west. Um, these are direct quotes from the fishermen aboard the vessels, and hence the, the title of the film. Uh, it is also important to note that this, uh, the middle picture here um, shows the restricted area that the U.S. military cordoned off uh, on the atolls and the, the boat, you can see the little, that's a very blurry picture. You can see the little X's that they were, they were well outside. There's, there's reports of 50 to 100 miles outside of the designated restricted area. So the fishermen were not doing anything wrong. And I really like um, this, the, the animation image here for perspective. Um, Castle Bravo and Hiroshima is not even registering on this chart in terms of kilotons. Um, there is a narrative film made out of this, uh, this story, a narrative Japanese film from 1959. There are no English subtitles, but I've taken um, some of the images from that film for this slide. Um, eight minutes after the flash, the crew heard the sound of a, like a bomb concussion. Um, and because they were very well, they were very familiar with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they knew what mushroom clouds were, uh, it was it was it was still a very sensitive international subject. International relations between U.S. and Japan were not good. Um, they kind of knew what it was. Uh, they hauled in their lines and prepared to head home. The uh, as they were doing this, as they were hauling in the fishing lines and getting out of there, uh, a, a, a snowy substance began to fall on them. This was ash from the coral reefs at the atoll that had been churned up by this gigantic explosion turned into radioactive material and then 
showered all over the sea. So this radioactive ash was falling on the boat, on the water, on the fishermen, on the fish. You can see there's like footprints here coming out of the snowy substance. Um, this ash came to be called Shinohai, uh, which translates to the ashes of death. Uh, some thought that this was snow, but they were way too far south for snow. And also it wasn't the time of year, way too far south, too far south for snow. Um, knowing no better, some of the fishermen tasted the ash. Um, unbeknownst to them, it was coral reef churned up by the blast. They lived with the ash on the boat for the entire two week journey back to Japan, not knowing what it was. Uh, March 14th, 1954, two weeks later, the Lucky Dragon returns to Yaizu, which is its home port uh, with very little fanfare. A couple days later, after the fishermen had been in and out of the hospital and some people had leaked about what they saw, uh, the story broke. Um, Japanese fishermen encountered bikini nuclear test, 23 contract radiation sickness. Uh, I'm highlighting these three fishermen here because these are the fishermen that are, that are the subject of the movie. Um, Masaho Ikeda, Susumu Misaki, and Matashuchi Oishi. Um, they were, at the time of filming, they were three of five surviving fishermen on uh, the Lucky Dragon. These were the only three fishermen that were willing to, to speak to us about the incident. But I want their names to kind of be highlighted in this conversation. And we'll see a lot more of them throughout the presentation. Um, while Japan's tuna industry plummets and mass protests begin, testing continues. So March 14th, the story breaks. The U.S. knows about it. The U.S. has already sent doctors. Japan has said, no, we don't want your doctors because they're just going to do tests and they're going to learn about radiation. That's not what we want. Um, but the U.S. doesn't stop testing. They keep doing their six castle tests. There's Castle Union, Castle Yankee, Castle Romeo. I believe there's an echo in there somewhere. All of them are around the same areas in the ocean, all of which have similar devastating results and consequences for different tuna boats, um, different fishermen, uh, different families. You know, we can see, we can start to see the, the widespread damage that these things are beginning to cause. But um, this is in effect the start of what is still a very, very powerful anti-nuclear weapons movement in Japan. Uh, September 23rd, I want to make sure that's the right date. I believe September 23rd, um, Aikichi Kubayama becomes very, very sick due to radiation exposure. He had been experiencing jaundice. He was in the hospital with all the other fishermen, exposed in the same way as the other fishermen. Um, but he was, he was very, very much worse off than the rest of the crew was. Uh, he was the radio man. So responsible for communicating back to uh, back to Japan, positioning the boat, navigating, et cetera. Oldest member of the crew, he was 40 years old. He had been fishing for most of his life, very well respected by his coworkers. Uh, and the fishermen that were all around him in the hospital, all exposed to the same thing that he was, all witnessing the same thing that he did, all kind of watched him die this very, very slow, painful death. Uh, his last words being, I pray I am the last man to be killed by a nuclear weapon. Um, May 20th, 1955, fishermen of Daigo Fukuyamaro leave the hospital after 15 months of quarantine. Um, life did not return to normal. They were uh, ostracized from their communities. They received a certain level of compensation. For their, injury, for their injuries from the US and the Japanese government. They were looked at as being, I'm using air quotes if you can't see me, but they were looked at as being lucky for experience, for having this um, compensation because it was a, uh, it was not a lot of money, but it was enough money at the time to be considered a lot of money. Um, so they left this sort of really horrible situation, incident on a boat, really awful 15 month quarantine in a hospital to going back to communities, which now were, you know, kind of scared of them or didn't, maybe didn't believe them, or there was just a, there was a lot of misinformation at the time. Um, so they, they did not have a, a grand welcoming entrance back into the communities that they love so much. Um, yeah, 1955 to present day and ongoing, the immediate consequences 
fishermen shunned by communities that didn't understand radiation. Again, at this time, we only had Hiroshima, only had. We had Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, to kind of base research and experiences on. Uh, and these were different weapons. Uh, the fishermen, when they wanted to start families and have children, were experiencing stillborn births. Uh, they lost family and loved ones. Um, wives left them uh, being betrothed to, um, to high school sweethearts, et cetera. Their, their families did not want them to go through with marriages, et cetera. A lot of them turned to drinking, died in an early age because cirrhosis and, and other internal uh, organs were, were damaged by the radiation, um, thus accelerating their death. Uh, they were, uh, some of them were forced into hiding, not associating themselves with the lucky dragon at all. Um, today, all of the Lucky Dragon crew members have passed away. Uh, so over the past couple of years, we have been getting, you know, we've been communicating with fishermen. We were in Japan in 2019 um, for the release of the film. And we saw, uh, we met uh, for the last time, uh, uh, Masaho Ikeda. Uh, he passed shortly thereafter. Um, Oishi and uh, Misaki-san have also passed away. So this, this film, and we were one of the last crew, met, the last crews, film crews to film them. Um, so, you know, I'm very proud of being able to kind of carry their legacy and, and show more people the story because, you know, they're, they're no longer here to tell it. Um, every single year on March 1st, there is a annual anti-nuclear uh, event in Japan, um, which is held in Yaizu, and it's a march from the center of the city to Kubayama's grave. Uh, Kubayama, again, being the, uh, the crew member who passed away first. Um, there are roses laying at his grave. It's a very solemn, pro uh, uh, very solemn process, protest, I guess. Um, but there are demonstrations and protests that happen as well, conferences and peace events. And survivors uh, used to speak at occasional events and anti-nuclear activists have taken that taken that banner and continued that. Uh, and this is a picture of all 23 of the crew members with our three hero fishermen circled here. This is, uh, these were all taken in the hospital after their encounter with the bomb. So film production, um, what is this film? How did we do it? What, what's, uh, what's, what was the process behind it? Um, back in 2014, I was reading this book here in the center and again, I don't know if you can see me, but I have all of these books here still, prized possessions. Um, but I was reading this book called Command and Control by Eric Schlosser, who wrote Fast Food Nation, Reefer Madness. Um, amazing, amazing book about the mismanagement, mishandling, misappropriation of America's nuclear stockpile. And it reads like, it reads like a joke, like, like, like silos being unlocked or, you know, going to a, 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 a site where missiles are being stored and the guards are drunk and, you know, accidents where a plane is flying over North Carolina and, and uh, a, a, a bomb bay door opens and drops a bomb on a farm. Just like crazy stuff that you wouldn't, that, that, that just shouldn't happen, wouldn't happen is like being, you know, it's talked about in this book and it's a 500, 600 page book. It reads so fast um, but sandwiched in the middle of this book in like 10 sentences uh, is this little blurb about the lucky dragon. And I was reading that and I read it over and over and over again. I was like, why don't I know anything about this? Why haven't I heard anything about this? This seems like a bigger deal. And some basic Googling and basic research led to a book uh, called The Day the Sun Rose in the West by Oishi-san, by one of our hero fishermen. We got to meet him. And then The Voyage of the Lucky Dragon by Ralph Lapp. Uh, Dr. Ralph Lapp is an important name to know because he was a Manhattan Project scientist turned activist. Uh, once he saw what the Manhattan Project was going to lead to, he was like, uh-uh, I'm not doing this, and kind of changed his tune and started working towards advocacy. Uh, but uh, so these were our three sort of main texts. Um, and some other basic research led us to the Daigo Fukuyu Maru Exhibition Hall. So there is a museum in Japan, in Yumenoshima Park, uh, in Tokyo, in the center of Tokyo, Tokyo Bay, uh, that houses the Lucky Dragon. 
And uh, if you can see behind me, I took this photo, but if you can see behind me, 180 degrees, Tokyo Bay is right behind me, the big Ferris wheel and all of that. Uh, but the boat exists. The boat is found. The boat is clean. It's decontaminated. It's there. It's a museum for all to see. All of these relics, you can touch it. You can walk up to it. It's a really, really powerful place to be. If you ever find yourself in Japan with an afternoon, it's a, it's a fantastic place to go. Um, these are the three fishermen. As, I, as I've already introduced you to, Masahiro Okeda is an engine room worker. He was sleeping at the time of the blast. He woke to the sound of the bomb and ran to the engine room. Matushichi Oishi, a refrigeration man responsible for the preservation of all the fish. He was on deck and working at the time of the blast. And then Susumu and his wife, Teruku Misaki. Uh, Susumu was a wheelman and a deckhand responsible for steering the boat. Uh, so all three of these fishermen have very different perspectives and very different um, they had very different perspectives on the day of what they heard, saw, felt, um, needed to do. So they represented a very, very interesting cross-section of what actually happened on that boat. Uh, in terms of production, we had our two translators, Akiko and Ms. Kazuya-san. Um, we had two interviewers, myself and my cousin, Peter, uh, who's a very, very good interviewer. So we, uh, he, he came along with us. Two cameras, we had two hours with each interview with each fisherman, and we had a long list of questions. These are just some stills from that process. Um, these, these kind of land differently when if you've seen the movie already. Uh, but because this was an animated process, we had to build upon um, ideas and what we were doing, right? So it was a very, very long process of building out animations and building out. Um, you know, camera moves and building out dolly moves and scope and rooms and all of this stuff that it just took a really long time. And so what we actually ended up doing was doing about three or four passes of the entire movie, right? So um, I'm not a, uh, an artist by any stretch. And you can tell that from stage one here. Um, these are my drawings, which I don't believe have passed the fourth or fifth grade in terms of detail or technique or artistry or whatever. Um, but this is a tea kettle, if you can believe it, with a little handle and steam coming out. Uh, and I did an entire movie, uh, hour and 17 minutes of these horrible stick figure pencil drawings. Um, and I turned this over to Josh, who we introduced you to earlier, who storyboarded the entire thing with real drawings, because Josh is an actual artist. So he made beautiful, beautiful drawings of teapots and of fishing boats and of everything else. Um, and then Josh also hand drew what would be the final, um, the final animated elements within the shots, right? So every shot had its own, whether it's people or fish or tea kettle or uh, Geiger counter, Josh drew all those by hand. And while all this was going on, Justin, our 3D animator, was creating the worlds that these would live in the rooms, the scenes, the camera moves, the, all of that stuff. So these four elements combined over the process of, you know, maybe two years, we ended up with the final shot with all of the elements in place, the steam, the, the, the stove top, the kettle, et cetera. And again, just another example. This is a boat, if you can tell, with birds. <laughs> And hand it over to Josh, who knows what he's doing. And we get a beautiful boat with birds. And then Justin turning these into 3D replicas um, within the worlds that he's created. And we get these 3D composites with camera moves and renders and with these sort of beautiful backdrops and, you know, rack focuses and all of this stuff. And again, just some more. I always laugh when I see these, just thinking about the process. Uh, and then just a couple images of the soundtrack. Um, working in my brother's living room with a couple friends. Very, very guerrilla independent filmmaking going on. And then we had the amazing honor uh, of going to Japan with the film in 2019 is one of the last trips that, that we did as a family before COVID happened. 
Um, but this is myself, my wife, and my brother uh, meeting Ikeda san. Uh, at this point, Ikeda san was the only survivor. Oishi and Sumu, uh, Susumu Masaki had already passed. Um, but we had some sold out audiences in Tokyo and Yaizu and uh, Shizuoka. And just an amazing sort of experience to have it be full circle like that. Um, couple, couple Japanese newspapers writing about it. Uh, and educational toolkit. <clears throat> so this is where um, this is where I uh, I kind of lose a little bit of steam because I said I'm not an educator, and this this educational toolkit that we're going to talk about and people are going to work with and access and all of that was put together by a team of teachers um, with myself kind of co-authoring and doing some graphic design. So I can I'm going to walk you through. Um, what's in it and walk you through some examples of what some of the educators have done with this toolkit. And, and then we can talk about it later, or we can, we can kind of engage about like what certain things might mean or, or, or certain, like why the teachers did some of the things that they did because the, um, the authors of the toolkit, Angie Stokes and Kachina Lee, uh, they, they, they have taken this toolkit that they wrote and are implementing it within their art classes and history classes and, um, and things like that. So they've, they've really latched onto this, um, which is you know, a huge honor and have taken it to this other level. Uh, but it is a, um, it's a 50 page toolkit. There's, I think there's six or seven post screening lessons and one or two pre-screening lessons. Um, the pre-screening lessons being, a, I, I think we'll get into it, the pre-screening lessons being a little bit more historical based, um, things like that. Uh, so, yeah, educational toolkit, it comes with a table of contents and teacher resources. Um, yeah, these are the pre-screening lessons um, which educators can use to kind of introduce the subject matter um, and kind of do what I just did, I guess, introduce like the context of what is going on and it can be taken in a lot of directions, right? There's social, environmental, political, geo, you know, geopolitical, geographical implications for the story, right? And so it can, it can kind of be used in a lot of different ways, depending on what, what you're teaching and to whom you're teaching it on uh, what age groups, et cetera. Uh, every lesson has one of these sort of overviews um, of the lesson, essential questions that will be asked and activities that kind of direct educators what to do with their students or how they can engage with, the, how they can engage with their students. Um, and also there's a detailed um, uh, biography, bibliography and uh, sources. So if there's any sort of like Einstein's letter which is really, really interesting to read and to kind of pick out the details of what, because Einstein knew how dangerous this was, but also knew how, um, how powerful it could be and how like the US being the self-proclaimed kind of protectors of democracy or whatever, um, you know, could, you know, could use it for good or could use it for ill, you know, the, Einstein's letter is a very, very interesting study in this um, series of historical events. And this is kind of how it's laid out um, with introductions, synthesis and analysis. Um, some activities and stats and students can engage with infographics. Um, and these are all these are all meant to be like prompts and ideas, not anything hardcore or set in stone. Um, Again, not being an educator, but Angie Stokes has put a lot of these things in here. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not well versed in next gen science standards, um, but you know, earth and human activity from molecules to organisms, ecosystems, earth and human activity, matter and its interactions, all of these things are kind of encompassed within the film, right? When you talk about how nuclear energy is generated, how nuclear energy affects the the earth and how it affects people um you know 
it's it's all uh, it can all kind of be wrapped up into this into this conversation. Lesson two goes into a, a shared history, um, kind of picking apart Japan and the U.S. Japan history and U.S. history and the relationship between the two, um, which which is a great relationship, um, not without complications, but you know we have a great relationship with Japan. So how did how did this incident affect? You know, how did World War II affect the, the relations between U.S. and Japan? How did Daigofuku Yamaru and Castle Bravo affect the relations between the U.S. and Japan? Because there is a marked, um, there is a there is a stark difference between those between how the countries reacted to each of those incidents. So looking at those from a Japanese perspective and U.S. perspective is a very interesting study as well. Um, and then Angie pulls out the social studies standards, um, time, continuity, and change, and science, technology, and science and technology standard. Um, again, kind of hearkening back to how, um, how, how relationships have developed and changed over time. Post screening lessons. Um, one, two, three, four. Yeah, there's four. So, four post screening lessons. And this just kind of goes through. All of those, a bunch of terms and definitions. Um, these are really interesting. Angie has her students watch the film and then um, draw or come up with Kamishibai stories of their own that have stood out to them. Um, so these are some very, uh, very interesting images. They mean a lot to me because I'm so I, I know the story so intimately, you know, the boat leaving the dock. This is obviously the, the boat at the, when the bomb goes off. Um, television is another, plays another very interesting role in the film because TV was just introduced to Japan at the time of this incident. Um, so while the fishermen were in the hospital for these 15, 16 months of quarantine, they had a, they had a TV. It was a lot of the, the first time that that the fishermen had ever watched TV. And on top of that, they were watching themselves on TV because that's all the news was. So imagine that, right? Like you're, 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 you're a fisherman in 1950s Japan. You, you're watching your own story on the TV that you don't really understand what is going on in your, in the, in your own story. First of all, because you've been, you know, irradiated and you don't know what that means. And then you're watching commentary you know, reporters would go around to people in their hometown and be like, would you marry these fishermen? No, I wouldn't because they're contaminated. Why would anybody marry them? And then fishermen are watching this in their hotel, in their hospital room. It's just, it's a baffling situation to be in. And so, you know, obviously these things have stood out to some of these students and they put them in the, within their own Kanishibai sort of projects. Um, there's a, some very interesting Time Life articles. I'm not sure why Angie included this here, but this article is available in, in Life magazine from uh, late March, 1954, where it talks about the first casualties. So, you know, like I said, hearkening back to when, you know, this article, what was this, 19, 1950, March 26, 1954, and the U.S. continues to test through, they test those weapons through April or May, I believe. So the word was out and the U.S. is still doing its thing. Uh, growing collections of resources and then more lessons. I'm just kind of going through the lessons at this point. Um, if anybody wants to use this as a transition to um, kind of asking questions or talking a little bit more about Kamishibai or anything like that, that would be wonderful. Um, we're making, oh, these are, so Angie herself is, um, is she, she makes Kamishibai boxes. So this box here on um, the right is a box that Angie built. So she builds these for, I don't think it's a side, side business or anything. She builds it for her, her for her kids and for museums. And, um, but she, she has her kids build one in, class and they kind of make their own Kamishibai plays, you know. 
Um, English standards. Her kids have, I'm trying to find the, there's a, this is the website, the Lucky Dragon Museum website. There is a page in here. Oh yeah, here it is. So students from her school, which is Wayne Trace, Wayne Trace High School in Wayne Trace, Ohio, have won Scholastic Art Gold Key and, Schol and Scholastic Art Silver Key Awards for some of this art that was inspired by the film. Um, so Angie has really taken it to, and she's, she's an art teacher, you know? So she's using it, she's, she's connecting history and art and connecting um, some of these standards to kind of give, give like, like push your students to think about the possibilities and the implications of what her art or what, what art can actually do or how art can tell stories, how art can affect people, et cetera. I think it's a really, it's a really interesting application of all of these things. Um, student drew the, this is the engine. This is the actual engine from the Lucky Dragon that um, Masaho Ikeda worked on. It, uh, there's a really, there's a really, there's a really interesting, the boat itself, that boat, the Lucky Dragon, the structure itself, aside from the story, um, the boat is a really interesting story too, because I, as I mentioned, it was um, built with wood <clears throat> after World War II because it was, there was no, no materials to build. Steel and metal were very scarce. Um, and so they built this boat out of basically like wood that they found on the, that had washed up on the shores of the beaches in Japan. Um, after the Lucky Dragon incident, after the bomb incident, it was the boat itself was radioactive. So they kind of put it off to the side and nobody went on it. Nobody, you know, nobody, nobody touched it. Um, they eventually decontaminated it, turned it into a, 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 a teaching boat for, I believe it was tuna fishing. So it was like part of the Japanese um, school of fisheries boat. I, I forget the actual name, school of fisheries institution. Uh, and then there was a storm and then it sunk <laughs> and then the engine fell out. And so um, I think it was like sometime in the 80s, sometime in the late 70s or 80s, there were divers in Tokyo Bay and they happened upon this boat and discovered that it was the Lucky Dragon. And they're like, whoa, we need to preserve this thing. This was like sunk underwater in Tokyo Bay. And so that very early picture that I showed you of the museum, the Triangle Museum, Tokyo Bay behind me. They basically hauled it out. There's photos of this. They hauled it out of the water and set it up right there. And that's where the museum is. It's kind of built the structure around it. Um, so that's where that's that's why the location of that museum is there. But then, like even a decade later or so, they found the engine and they hauled that up. And now they preserve that right outside the museum, this little area. Uh, yeah. TV again. Um, Angie provides the link. I can put this in the chat if you wish, but this is a very interesting animation of every single explosion, nuclear explosion that has happened on the face of the planet since 1945. Um, and the countries that are responsible for those. So it's really interesting to watch that too and kind of see where the the locations of these explosions and where geographically it would have had the largest effect, et cetera. Uh, and that is kind of all that I have for the presentation. I love talking about the Lucky Dragon and um, I can be available as long as you need me to chat more about it or to answer questions or to show more resources or whatever, whatever you as a collective group think I can help you with, I would love to, love to be a part of that. So thank you very much.